Alright, I can't remember which one of you nerds recommended that I should cover this movie, but why do you like this? It's like Twilight mixed with Spider-Man origin story mixed with parasites that eat your entire body from the inside out. I don't usually cringe from portions of a movie, but Mr. Sunglasses at Night just completely takes the cake on this one. On a small island, a group of scientists decide to, you know, believe the next phase of human evolution has to really be brought on by ourselves, which arguably may be correct, up until they add, yeah, but it needs to be done utilizing parasites, which is actually one of the most dumb ideas as I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be one of those episodes simply because of one sentence uttered that was just, it had me sitting there thinking, how could they have honestly forgotten that? Anyways, it is what it is. After developing this parasite, things looked promising at first, right up until the parasites shockingly started acting like parasites. As things turned towards the worst, the town was inundated with these parasites as they spread through the containment teams sent out and any average person who just happened to be living there. Eventually, the team of scientists and remaining townsfolk were able to hold off on the outbreak and then quell it, but not before many people were lost. In today's episode, we will talk about the parasite, what it does to the human body, and potentially how it is able to do that, and ultimately why it leads to a degradation that anyone with half a brain sloshing around the old calcium container would probably have thought out and, well, kind of knew this would be the end result. Oh, people didn't know the last movie I covered was The Cursed, so I'm just going to say the title here. The movie is called Growth. So as per usual, up on screen you'll see a timestamp. If you want to bypass a summary, head there. This is one of those wear a helmet sort of movies, so I regret to inform you that I will in fact have to dunk on it. So if if you don't want to hear that, go to the science portion. For all others, let's get to why when you develop a super parasite, you uh, may actually want to know what the half-life is, or maybe have a speck of thought concerning containment of the enhanced humans that you are creating, which should probably rank up there pretty high. You know, just a thought. So we start off our story with one in four Americans have parasites, which I would like to stand here and tell you that, shh, no, that's so wrong. No way, man. But actually, it's estimated that 80% of Americans have parasites in their guts, and that goes for the rest of the developed world as well, and also in undeveloped areas. Areas, it's likely higher, though it's best just not to think about it. But as you imagine, if 80% of us have parasites, most of those are going to be non-deadly, but this thing's like, oh, many of them are deadly. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Anyway, so starting off for real now, we see a man running through the forest, sporting massive chimp energy, as he is case number 113 from two days previous. The police are hot on his tail, taking pot shots at him as he dodge dips, ducks, dives, and dodges through the tree line. Leading the police out onto the beach, they tell him to stop once more before we see this guy really isn't looking so hot, and as he looks out of the ocean, he decides that is his best recourse as something crawls under his skin. Jumping in, we don't see what happens, but the cops do, as well as there is just a bunch of yelling. Also, the cop in the back looks like a younger Nicolas Cage. It could be him, but who knows how many movies this man has been in. As a sponsored by Chevy Blazer pulls up, which if you didn't know, Blazer is the pavement princess. The trailblazer is the one you actually want to probably drive on sand with. The rest of the group joins the officers, and they find the man's clothes washed up and steaming, and there's no sign of this guy out there. On a slow news day in April of 1985, we get news reports of everyone's super super jazzed about how the scientists were able to create pearls, which we now do by intentionally just placing grains of salt in oysters. I mean, they sent several news teams out there for this. Anyways, we now get to the flash through about winter 1988. The scientists are using the same parasites that created the pearls to remove the limitations placed on humans by their own DNA. That's a bold strategy, Cotton. He mentions how they have distribution in six out of the eight territories. What is six out of the eight territories? Well, it's never explained again or even what that is. And everyone is required to wear a white wife beater, but during the press conference, people are getting slammed into the glass denoting that everything is now going to crap. Then we get a playthrough of parasites just spreading, graves being dug, people getting bodied, you know, the usual stuff. Which now we end up at the present day, but considering this was in 720p, it's not our present day, but we meet a group of friends who honestly, we are back at the, this group has no chemistry and don't even look like they would hang out with each other. Anyways, Jamie organically introduces everyone. The older guy is her boyfriend Marco, the younger guy in the back is her stepbrother Justin, the woman driving is Sarah, and the girl next to her is her apparent best friend Kristen. And now you know the whole gang. But I also just want to point out the baby's eyebrows in the background. Uh, I don't know what's going on with that. So there's a lot going on in this car. Kristen spent her trust fund on Justin as he has low immunity and got sick. But apropos timing, because Jamie's great uncle Mason bit the dust and left her a $2 million property for her to sell. So now she's a millionaire, which is why they are even out here in the first place to pay back Kristen, it looks like. And as they drive, they pass by a green screen sign displaying the town name before zooming into a stock image of a house in the distance. A family is going to sleep for the night, but as the wife shuts her eyes, the daughter shows up. They flip on the light to see that she's infected as the dad tries to fist fight the parasites before getting infected themselves, showing that the island is very much so still sporting this parasite. And this scene, uh, I'm pretty sure was directly ripped from <laughs> Dawn of the Dead. I'm just pointing that out. Getting to the house, Kristen wonders how it's worth $2 million. Well, back in 2010, and considering the housing market right now, just wait 12 years, Kristen. I'm sure that shutout back will be worth $2 million easily, because the whole world has lost its mind. But Jamie stayed up all night making CD 
CDs, which, oh my god, I remember the days. But the plan is to get everything cleaned up and then sold off. Kristen grabs Justin and draws a mustache on him, and I'm getting the vibe. Justin is not on his Sigma male grind set right now. Now maybe that's just why the baby had eyebrows she drew it on. I don't know. Anyways, just so you know, there's no cell service out here. As Jamie enters the creepiest section of the house first, she finds a ton of dolls with hair. Okay. Which then transports her back in time to her dancing as a kid and having a loving relationship with her mom, who's very proud of her. Now she's on stage. Just what is happening? So it's obvious at this point, Kristen is interested in Justin, but the dude is just not picking up the hints here. Like, it's painful. But as Marco goes to play Snake Alone outside, a car starts up behind him and takes off before they can answer Marco's questions. The next morning, Jamie is going through all of her uncle's projected proposals, and Kristen is heading out for a run. Justin has got sorry written across his head, and considering Kristen used her trust fund to keep him alive, you think he maybe would be more grateful for that? No, oh well. As Kristen runs along, she spots a group in all black in some sort of funeral procession, carrying the pictures of two men as Mr. Creepy Trenchcoat hangs out in the background. We now head over to an autopsy table. Two doctors are discussing how the parasites are coming back. They started with engineering the parasites to create pearls, perfect pearls, that they then sold to fund more research, which naturally somehow led to human testing. You know, standard jump there. But here's the statement. I mean, it's just beautiful. We set out to make the perfect human. They became stronger, intuitive. But we made one major miscalculation. The parasites need to feed and consume the host from the inside. Like, dude, no kidding. You don't say. But as the doctor walks away, leaving the lady doctor, a parasite exits the body on the table, and we see that other parasites are able to be bodied by salt. So now Larkin and Jake show up to scold Dr. McAvire as he brought Jamie to the island because he believes that she has the antidote. They say this is their mess to clean up and there is not an antidote, so he should probably just drop it. But while they discuss the philosophical implications of what amounts to feeding people to parasites, the other doctor gets infected. Running in, they immediately dome her without a second thought. She's pretty brutal. So now we see Justin chopping wood. He talks to Kristen about being alone and writing poems in the sand with his tears and how his mom will never understand him, but he needs a ride to the mall. So if she could just take him in the minivan, he could be with his friends. Okay, well, that's a lie, but that's the vibe of the whole conversation. It's just super edgy. So Jamie has another hallucination fit where her uncle is measuring her and talking about antidotes. There's like a ton of exposition in this movie, by the way. You don't really get to see anything. You just get told it. But during this fit, Larkin shows up to snap her out of it. He extends his condolences, but tells her she can't sell the land to non-islanders for the two million, but he's willing to offer her 75000 for the land and home. Oh yeah, that would become a straight up waiting game for this old man to bite the dust before me, probably. Then I'll sell it, seeing as, you know, he's no longer even around. Or maybe just join the island council and stage a coup. Or just lawyer up, because I'm pretty sure, uh, what is it? He says local laws trump state laws? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, now for some reason, Marco is checking under the mattress, like no prompting, he just goes to the mattress and lifts it up, and then they find something there. No idea why this dude, like, that's his first inclination. So Kristen and Justin are out for a walk where she continues to hit on him, but it's going over about as well as a fart in church. She finally tells him that she likes him, and he turns her down because of the game that they were playing, but then they go and sit by the lake. But as they talk about the game, Justin goes to get into the water, and we see Mr. Parasite Man with the boots from Spongebob movie standing near the water, as well as the parasite approaching underneath the waves. Also, we get this weird focus on Kristen's right butt cheek. I mean, we all know what they were doing here. And then Justin starts getting frisky with Kristen. But as he does, the parasite then enters his foot. Okay, so I'm not going to spin forever on this, but uh, it looked like they were doing something, but they still just have clothes on. You know what? You can see it. Anyways, after entering his foot, his vision changes, and now he's been infected. Back at the 75k shack, Jamie and Marco find pearls and creepy dolls, which triggers hallucinations in Jamie once again. They also go on to find a movie as well, with Mason and Einstein being together, because as mentioned, a lot of doctors ended up on the island after World War II for some reason. But it's a video about the press day, as Kristen then comes bursting in, which everybody then exits the house just as the outbreak in the tape begins. So I guess bad timing, but Mason continued refining the parasites, but nobody saw it. As they yell for Justin, he's like right next to them, but they don't see him until he puts up his hand, and he's also not looking so hot. Kristen sees something moving under his skin as they get him back to bed. Jamie then rushes to Sarah's house, saying something is wrong with Justin. Kristen elects to stay with Justin at this point, and also, look at this dude following the car with his lights off, like real smart. That doesn't look obvious at all. Jamie then goes to another house where he spots a man in a chair not helping them because he's being eaten by CGI parasites. So Mr. Tailgater now gets smart and follows them with his lights on, looking like a normal person, while Kristen plays her accordion for some reason. But there appears to be someone outside. As Kristen goes to clean off the mirror and start her skincare routine, Justin accidentally rips the door off its hinges, like soldier status. Justin now hears random 
him talking in his head and ask Kristen for round two as, uh, my man. Anyways, continuing to look for help, they spot the car that was following them earlier. As Kristen calls them over the walkie-talkie, she tells them that Justin's better now. I bet he's feeling a lot better. Marco also cannot find any phones in the area to call for help. Around 1 a.m., Justin just wakes up with super hearing and extreme sensitivity to light, even a moonlight. He hears some of the neighbors getting frisky in a house, which, okay. Then he hears stuff in the woods as he lets parasites out of his leg. Putting tissue paper in his ears, he goes over to Kristen, but she's not up for round three, so he's like, alright, bet, and then goes to a bar instead. All the while, I just want to point out, Sarah is literally doing laundry at 1 a.m. Why? So now Justin dons the cool guy persona, puts on sunglasses at night, and then goes and orders a whiskey before spotting a woman looking at him. And here's where the cringe fest absolutely starts. He sits down with this woman and starts goodwill hunting her, telling her what she wants to hear. Her friend interjects, but he's like, you should leave him. Bro, you don't know completely unrelated circumstances. <laughs> like, I mean, I get reading the room, but this is ridiculous. So the cringing continues as the boyfriend isn't having it. He challenges him to fight, which results in, like, literally the scene from Spider-Man where everything is slower. I feel like this movie just borrowed a ton of scenes from other movies. The friends then jump in and it's the same thing. So now the girlfriend is hot and bothered by this, so she elects to leave with Mr. Parasite. So you just saw this guy crush pavement with his foot, and you go with him. Again, been watching too much Twilight around this time, uh, at least she was, and I see the connections that they're trying to make here, and it causes me great pain. So going out with them, they are making out, and he just straight up rips out her throat when she sees his little friend coming out of his ear. I suppose that's what disloyalty gets you. He wakes up the next morning without the tissue paper, and he's like, oh, did that happen? Yes, it did. Jamie comes in and gives him breakfast in bed, and then starts expositioning again about her dad and mom. Jamie tells Justin that he's not getting that treatment because they aren't getting that money. He goes and then throws up what's left of that girl in the toilet and a bunch of worms. <laughs> that was nasty. But Miss Trust Fund is out on another run. As she runs along, she ends up finding something, and Justin tests out his Captain America strength on some firewood before going full Minecraft on some trees. Flashing back over to Kristen, we find that she finds a pathway to a graveyard. Looking at all the crosses, she turns around to spot Parasite Man is behind her. She maces him in the face and runs as Justin now finds out he's got worms and then heads back to chop more wood, which I'm not sure that would be my response to that. But you see, firewood moves the plot along here. Justin hears a scream in the distance, but Marco apparently doesn't. He's out there awkwardly asking Justin if he can marry Jamie. I don't know, man. When I asked my father-in-law, it really wasn't that awkward. You just gotta find a pair between your legs and then just ask. But Justin is hearing more screams and tells Marco, sure, bro, I'd love to be your brother, <laughs> and then runs off to find Kristen. But things aren't going so well for her as a giant parasite enters her mouth, so I can only assume that she's basically donezo now. Jamie finally tells Marco that they aren't rich anymore, but as he goes to propose in a living room, Larkin and McAvire show up, saying there was a note on the door that someone was sick. Jamie tells them that he got better quickly, so not to worry about it, and then they start naming off his symptoms, to which she says, yes, he had all those, which then alarms the two. McAvire pulls out sunglasses that were found near a bar next to the woman's body, which her neck appears to be a lot more healed now, strangely, but as the team then heads off to the lake to go capture Justin, Justin starts looking a little more sick as time goes on. So now as Sarah looks outside, we also see that she's been infected watching a team run by. Heading back to Justin, he's holding Kristen's body, which probably doesn't look too good for his mental stability, then the team moves in on him. So the budgeting of this film is truly something to behold. So now this fight takes place, which is hilarious as he counters all the guards, and just like the worms uh, in Fry when he eats that ham sandwich from a gas station in Futurama, they start fixing his wounds. Again, everything is just borrowed. The worms in the movie are just apparently based off these other worms. So Jamie and Marco then run, as they realize what's kind of happening, so Jamie gets grabbed and Marco doesn't notice? I'm not really sure how. Marco goes to defend Justin before taking a shell in the back, and the one guy who literally has the pellet dispenser drops it to hand-to-hand -hand attack Justin. Why? <laughs> Anyways, for this stupidity, he gets his arm ripped off. That guy deserved it. Also, you can still see his arm in the hoodie. <laughs> he turns back around. Oh my god, this movie. Ugh. Okay. So, Jamie now gets dragged off to some unknown fate as Jake, Larkin, and McAvire go to clean up the infected. Jake asks McAvire how this happened. He suggests a potential half-life. As he goes to tape up his pants so he doesn't get infected, a parasite then crawls up his leg and infects him. McAvire stands up, but then Jake immediately domes him. This is pretty brutal. Meanwhile, Jamie wakes up in saw, but it turns out to be her Uncle Mason. He does some creepy stuff like pull a parasite out of his face and goes like, ooh, here, look, gross, right? Then puts it in some salt to take it out. This causes another flashback to where Jamie is hiding underneath the table and for some reason playing in a lab as Mason infects Jamie's mother with the parasite, saying that she has to give him the antidote now. Now here's what I don't get. Why did she destroy the antidote? That doesn't make any sense. Shouldn't it be like a good thing to have the thing destroy the parasites? Larkin tells her to give it to them, but she clearly doesn't have it. So snap back to reality, Jamie catches Mason 
Grayson monologuing about the countermeasures he has created and why he had to infect himself. And as he does this, she just frees herself because he didn't tie it very well, and then runs off, breaking all the antidotes he had created, sending him reeing over that. At this point, the island is now overrun with parasites as countermeasures are being set up. As Jamie moves along through what I can only assume is like a sewer system, she can hear a ton of noises from Mason having a tipper tantrum down the way looking for her. She ends up hiding in some room with a needle at the ready. Larkin then finds Mason and confronts him as Jamie nopes out to go get salt water. She pours it on Mason, whose parasites immediately jump ship to get away from the salt. So now it all comes out. Jamie is upsetting spaghetti at Larkin because she says he helped in her mother, but really Larkin helped her escape the island as if she had the antidote, it would stop Mason's plan. I know, this all sounds really stupid. As she explains this, Larkin stops with a car in front of him. They find a baby crying as well as Sarah going completely feral from the infection, then spits a parasite at Jamie who pulls it out of her hand and Larkin is forced to subdue Sarah. And subdue her he does. And they're also being, you know, watched by Justin. Getting to a boathouse, they find the Pearl Operation where the pearls are preserved in salt and shipped around the world. Larkin hands Jamie the gas can telling her to go fill the boat as he goes to confront Justin. But he's mega infected and also going feral as well. Larkin throws salt at Justin but then is bitten on the hand and neck by Justin as Jamie lets the boat go to get Justin's attention. Then says, oh, if you're focused on the right hand, you can't see what's happening in the left. It was like the only reference they made that made sense because it happened earlier in the movie. So then she takes off with the baby in another boat, leaving Justin behind as he's apparently coming to and is normal now. So a good thing that water is brackish. Being out in the open ocean now, she sneezes and spits up a ton of parasites, which this is the first time that we've seen anybody have any like sneezing or coughing of the parasites. I mean, vomiting maybe, which suggests that they are actually in the intestines, which we'll get to later, but why sneezing? There was nothing to indicate that they would be in the sinuses. Anyways, she goes to rinse her hand off in the water, but it burns her skin. She now apparently has the antidote and the clown doll, or at least the chemical composition of the antidote, which then she gives to a baby. And yeah, I'm sure that won't get lost. Also, when she stands up to jump in the water, the baby carrier is nowhere to be found on the boat, but as she jumps in, she basically dissolves. Then we get radio chatter that's just icing on the cake. There's a baby on a boat with no adults, so the Coast Guard requests permission to pursue rescue. Like, bro, what? That's not even something you have to request. You just do it and then tell dispatch afterwards. Like, what are they gonna say? Permission denied? Let that baby fry? God, this movie was just a stupid adventure. But now we jump over to Seoul six months later, as the Karen of the South Korean culture begins yelling at employees because she wants to return the pearls, but is denied without a receipt. She starts smacking the glass in the display case, which cracks the pearls and lets out a parasite, as they have turned out to be eggs the whole time, and now it's officially on the mainland. Woo! So, <laughs> man, where to begin on this one? First, what in the name of all that is holy even is this movie? They blew all that budget on the parasites, didn't they? Like, that CGI must be expensive. I'm not sure if this was in theaters or not, but I would have been pissed. Now with that out of the way, I think the first place we should start is with the parasite itself, then move on to what it actually does to the human body and how it may have succeeded in the matter, and why Justin did appear to be a bit abnormal concerning his infection, because there are clues as to why he may have accepted the parasitic infection much more readily. Concerning the parasite itself, the question becomes what sort of parasite is it? Well, first we need the designation of parasites that will typically infect humans and cause illness, and these are known as protozoan parasites, which are single celled organisms that can multiply and divide within the host themselves and are typically more dormant outside of the body. Then you have helminth parasites, which are essentially worms, although they are not visible to the naked eye in their adult stage, only being roughly about 20 to 30 cells in length compared to our eukaryotic cells. But unlike protozoa, they do not multiply within humans. And finally, we get to the ectoparasites, which live on the surface of the host or directly interact with the exterior of the host, such as lice, fleas, and mosquitoes. Now, it is entirely possible to contract parasites in all sorts of ways. The most well-known known parasite known to cause scabies is A, really annoying if you ever catch it, and B, purely a human parasite that likely has been with us since a time where we had much more hair all over our bodies. Then there's the personal favorite. It's known as Trick, Trichomonas vaginalis, which is a parasite that is literally an STI that presents in a lot of ways like gonorrhea or chlamydia in women, but will typically not inspire actual symptoms in males. You see, everything fun in life has to be ruined by some opportunistic infection. But I think we see fairly clearly that the infection taking place within growth is very clearly a helminth infection based upon the presentation of the parasites and the actual life cycle, albeit there are some things changed about the life cycle. So let's take a moment to look at that. Typically within the life cycle of a Helminth parasite, it requires a host for continued survival into adulthood. Those adults that dwell within the intestines of the host, which is also supported in growth as Justin ends up throwing up several larval parasites from his stomach into the toilet, which is nasty, reside within the intestines of the host, where they will mature into adulthood in both the movie and in reality. Once adulthood is reached, the next stage of the life cycle will begin where the adult 
will produce eggs. These eggs are excreted at some point through feces production, which will then move into the dirt, which will result in the larva being released. So a couple things can happen from here. If the larva requires an intermediate host to get into the main host, they will infect another species that happens by. This actually happens with my favorite parasitic infection, toxoplasmosis. Essentially, the parasite will infect rodents, which causes them to abandon cover and will actually make them sexually attracted to the smell of cat urine. Then they will be eaten by a bird of prey or by a cat, resulting in the infection of the primary host, which in turn allows the parasite to enter the next stage of its life cycle. Now, other animals can get caught up in this, like humans, for instance, which is not the intended host, and as far as we know, unless you, uh, you know, drop in your house, cats typically won't eat you, unless they're big cats, and there's really no bird of prey that we know of that can take us out. Which, that we know of. There's no bird of prey on Earth that can take us out. We're too big. But they can eat us if we do drop. So if the larva does not require an intermediate host, they will directly attack the main host and enter the body. In nature, there are plenty of parasites that will enter through the feet of humans as they penetrate the skin and then move into the interior of the body to enter the next phase of their life cycle. The last stage of their life cycle is essentially growth and reproduction. They will continue to rob the body of resources for their own metabolic needs, hence the parasitic nature of the animal, and continue to grow until reaching full maturity. Once maturity has been obtained, the animal will produce eggs and then start the process all over again. Now, how this appears to deviate from the actual parasite within the movie is first, the parasite replicates within the body, which is not typical of helminths. This is not to say that there are no helminths that replicate within the human body, but the thing to remember is that parasites are under constant attack from the immune system, and as such, it's not only rare, but very rarely observed. So the general consensus is that they just don't replicate within us. The parasite does have some countermeasures against the human immune system, however. And again, I've said it once, I'll say it again. Unfortunately, we do need parasites, and parasites need us. Turns out evolving on a planet infested with parasites will do that to your meat suit. Recent studies are concluding that the rise of allergies in first world countries may be linked to the absence of certain parasites which calm our immune systems by manipulating them. Without these parasites, our bodies are overreacting to standard things that we come across, like foods, and then reacting more aggressively towards it. This indicates that if we ever want to leave this rock, we will have to figure out the immune response manipulation of humans, or again, my suggestion a few videos back was just eat like a pound of dirt. Either way, it's a problem for future humanity if we are to leave Earth. But this is essentially how parasites are able to continue living within our bodies, seeing as we do have some immune defenses. Now, you wouldn't say Homo sapiens are a very good species at fighting off parasites. It's just not what we do. Take a virus or bacteria, we have way more luck and the responses that we use and have at our disposal are capable of bodying bacteria and destroying cells responsible for viral production, sometimes even to our own detriment. But parasites are different and difficult to get rid of. Because of their size, that's the first main hurdle our bodies have to overcome. For smaller cells to be attacking such a large animal, sometimes a parasite is just able to shake off the attack. In other instances, the parasite will actually grow thick material all over its body that when too many cells latch on and try to break it down, it will shed this outer layer and thus shed the immune cells off the body and continue on its way as the cells are just caught up focusing on attempting to break down the shell that's no longer even attached to the parasite. And still with others, if they don't have a way to sort of, or not really don't have a way, but don't have to maneuver away from immune cells, then they can release a substance that just tricks the immune cells into entering a more subdued state. But even with all these adaptations, the parasites are basically living life on easy mode because our immune system is not really all that strong when attacking parasites. With smaller parasites, you typically will have a cell known as eosinophils that will launch the main bulk of the attack against the parasite, as well as just your standard macrophage or white blood cell. These guys are considered to be both in the innate immune response, with the eosinophil being a late stage innate immune response, having more direction, but still not being a part of the adaptive immune system. Eosinophils have a few jobs, but their main job is to lyse, but then also produce an inflammatory response. They will latch onto the parasite and begin releasing cytotoxic materials to take out the invader. In some instances, a cell is able to achieve what it sets out to do. The parasite will lyse due to the material being leaked all over it, which will then disrupt its internal structures, leading to its end. But in a lot of instances, the eosinophil is not enough to subdue a parasite. It will try, but largely it will be unsuccessful. As a result, our bodies in a lot of ways have just learned to live with parasites. Again, because of the evolutionary pathway our species has taken, a vast amount of parasites that are just everywhere. But that's the thing to keep in mind when we go back to the helminth and growth. Our immune systems, well, for lack of a better term, they just sort of suck at fighting off parasites, and as such, parasites typically will continue to thrive within our meat suits until we begin excreting them out in one way or another, or they just completely break down our bodies, which will result in our end. Nasty little douche canoes. This is why I like to focus on viruses instead, just a different type of parasite. The helminth and growth is likely a type of roundworm, however, but it has two pathways at its disposal concerning its life cycle. The first is they do mature within the host, as seen with anyone who gets infected. During this maturation stage, 
stage, the symptoms appear beneficial to the host, which we will go over in a moment as to what exactly these are, but as the parasite reaches the adult stage, everything changes from here on out. Sort of like a parasite in the environment going from a small larva stage to clicking over to the infectious stage once a certain body size is obtained. So too are the growth parasites. Once their body is large enough, they will click over into the next stage, which is reproduction. So here's why the two doctors are complete idiots who uh, just created this thing, you know, for funsies. They were running off the premise that a parasite would not reproduce in the host, but seeing as they created pearls in the oysters, this was a big clue that they were in fact reproducing within the host. Rather than cracking open a few of the pearls and checking to see if they were actually eggs, they decided to just sell them and not do their due diligence. And because of this, they never understood that the parasites were actually splitting off into a new portion of the life cycle, which was reproduction within the host themselves. This means that when it came to humans, the desired effect of inject the parasite into the body to alter the DNA meant that at during the larval stage of the life cycle, the desired results were achieved. But once the parasite continued to mature, it really just became warm Vegas in there. Everything was hooking up with everything else left, right, and center. This would ultimately raise the energy requirements needed by the worms because getting frisky and producing offspring takes energy. So where was the worm going to take that energy from? Obviously, the host. And this is where the immune response would attempt to kick in, it appears, but it was too late for the body. Speaking of, let's take a look at what the parasite was doing to the body and why it was selected in the first place. Once introduced into the body by either an injection from a needle containing likely the eggs or at least the larva form entering, say, the base of your foot, the infection is all but assured. If you are injected with the eggs or smaller larva form, however, it would appear that it would take more time before the detrimental effects would begin ransacking your body. If you are infected with the later stage larval form that appears to be in the environment or just infected with the adult parasite in general, you have much less time to remain functional before becoming worm food. And again, this is because it's all based on which portion of the life cycle the parasite is in at that particular point in time. An adult that infects is ready to get frisky immediately, which does suggest that there may be a form of asexual reproduction considering Jamie was infected in the hand by one parasite and yet she had all those worms in her. And this is something that helminths are actually capable of, although most undergo a form of sexual reproduction. Once the eggs or younger larva grow, they would begin interacting with the host on a cellular level, which is what the doctors and scientists desired. However, I still don't buy that that's what the results they were getting, but I think something else was actually happening. In their studies, they claimed that the genetic coding of a person was altered, but to fine tune the genetic changes to this degree does not seem likely, mainly because parasites can induce changes in the DNA methylation profile of, say, immune cells, for instance, but to change the actual string of coding does not appear particularly possible as the parasites themselves do not appear to be infecting cells and furthermore do not appear to be altering genetic coding. Also, for your information, DNA methylation is when a methyl group is added to a substance such as DNA or a protein which allows it to function. So adding a methyl group to the DNA of an immune cell allows for that specific sequence to function. So from what it seems, this may have been the route the parasites were taking to increase gene expression in newly formed cells. But I believe that it's really just more of a hormonal thing than anything. Again, if it's adding methyl groups to certain functions of genes to cause gene expression, well, you could get a lot out of the body naturally by doing that. So we see that people appear stronger when infected. For instance, Justin was able to break off a piece of the parking lot before being stopped. On top of that, he was able to pull a man's arm off and in general had more strength than the average person and what they would possess. So how was this accomplished? Well, longtime viewers of this channel know that we humans are weak little babies, but only because of the giant nerd in our skull and it wanting us to be. On average, humans will only access about 30% of their strength normally, 50% through training and focus, and potentially up to 70% in an extreme situation where adrenaline is coursing through our veins. And this level can be increased further if you were, say, an Olympic weightlifter versus somebody who was just, you know, sitting on a couch for years at a time. The neural connections strengthen and improve through practice and repetitive motions with increasing pressure as your body thinks, oh, I guess I need extra muscle and neural connections as apparently we are doing something that requires it and I need to survive. So basically weightlifting is just hijacking your body's adaptive factor to think that whatever you're doing must be important. But we only access a fraction of our strength because otherwise our bodies would wear down too quickly. If we used 100% of our power our muscles are capable of, then we would just be in a situation where we were constantly injured. Imagine opening a fridge on 100% power and pulling the fridge down or damaging the door. And in turn, because you did that, damaging the joints and your shoulders and elbows. If you damage things enough over time, eventually they would just break down. Muscle pulling with that force would crack bones in older people or completely tear away from the bone. Basically, as you might imagine, it's not a good time. The takeaway here is, is that we are all way stronger than we believe ourselves to be, but the brain is actively inhibiting strength expression 
as a way to protect our bodies, and you can access it, or at least a portion of it, through weightlifting. So another thing we see within the movie is that time appears to slow down at certain points. Whenever he gets into a fight, people seem to slowly move past him as he gets out of the way and is faster as a result. Now, this is incredibly cringy, as this is clearly like that scene from Spider-Man 1, the real Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man, but the point is perception is increased. So let's see. Not only do you need to be stronger, but you need to have faster perception. Now, the general thinking is that time slows for you when you are in danger or something like adrenaline is released. And we are about to kind of use layman's term on this, and it's probably going to upset some people in the comments. But basically, when you go from safety to danger, the adrenal glands have their almonds activated. Your vision can slightly change, but to compare our eyes to a camera is not a one-to-one -one thing because our eyes are really not like cameras. But the best way to explain it is your brain is working quicker in the occipital area due to an increase of oxygen and sugars, which would, by comparison, be like raising your frames per second from 30 to 50 concerning your eyes. But also, your amygdala is activated within the brain during frightening events, which then you form richer, denser memories as to avoid that situation in the future. This runs on the same track as when you were a kid, you were making like a ton of memories because everything was new to you, right? So childhood seems to take forever, but as an adult, you make fewer memories, so time seems to slip by more quickly. Pretty wild, isn't it? Turns out the trick to slow down time is to make memories all the time. Anyhow, so while time doesn't necessarily slow down, our memory of specific events becomes richer, and it's important to note that there is a little bit of perception manipulation based on our brain activity, specifically, again, the occipital lobe, and that can help out in moments with perceiving, although to slow down time as much as the guy was experiencing is not likely. However, the same adrenaline does help with reaction time, increasing it considerably to allow you to actually survive a situation with, say, like a saber-toothed tiger. So finally getting to intuitiveness, it seems like Justin is doing, again, the goodwill hunting thing and was able to read the room beyond what would normally be capable. But what is reading a room? Really, it comes down to nothing more than recognizing patterns and applying those patterns to the current situation to explain what's happening outside of what would be considered your scope of knowledge concerning that specific situation. If you do that, it would be like you could read minds when really you are just analyzing the actions of others, such as aggressiveness towards a male that sits down to talk to your friend. Now, it's not perfect by any means, but that's what he's doing when he talks to Miss Loyalist's friend and then shuts her down. Their intuition is based on subconscious thought. So check it out. Have you ever felt like someone's watching you? You couldn't explain it, but you look around and boom, turns out someone was. It's not actually some supernatural thing or your brain perceiving outside of your scope of vision. The fact is, is that you actually did see them. You just didn't know that you saw them. Our brains evolved during a constant state of struggle against getting bodied by bigger animals. A predator's face just barely breaching a bush may not have been seen by your conscious mind as it's looking for other things, but a specific set of cells within the brain would fire off to alert you to be on edge as something was watching you, potentially picked up by your peripheral vision. This would make you feel on edge as you would look around and potentially even spot the predator before it got to you. This low level running in the background type of vision exists as what's in front of you is important to your survival, but what you don't see in front of you could also be important, but it should not take precedence over your central vision. So that feeling of being watched is because actually you saw that person looking at you, but you didn't see it with your central vision. You caught a glimpse of them from the side and your brain recognized a pattern and is trying to alert you to something that is basically looking at you. So that's why whenever you feel this, trust your gut instinct and follow it because you saw something you don't actually register that you saw. But this is also where the apparent intuitiveness comes from. The brain is still running its standard pattern searches in the background and with the worms potentially affecting the neurons functionings, as a result, this causes the person to appear to read a room at a higher capacity than what is normal. Now, all of this combined says to me again that this worm is affecting hormones more so than the actual genetic profile of a person. The first problem with that line of thinking is in what capacity would it be affecting the DNA? Is it replacing gene sequences? Is it turning off or switching on other genes? How would it know to do this? How would it survive the immune system? All of these come together to say what is actually happening here is it appears that the parasite is manipulating the body through expression of hormones, either by the worms themselves producing it, or by co-regulators that cause the organs to release the hormones. During a fight, more adrenaline would be released, making the person much stronger than what could be considered average, but not so strong that they rip muscle away from bone. Since we don't really see any signs of a crazy amount of muscle gain or changes on a fundamental level, we really just have an enhanced human. Now, the guy who gets his arm ripped off, remember, that's Justin in a more feral state, so his brain has even less control over the strength that he uses, so likely that's how that was capable, because there probably is a fair amount of brain damage once you enter the feral stage and the worms begin snacking on your neurons. But this low level, either a 
adrenaline level or hormone that mimics adrenaline produced by the worm would also give Justin the ability to form dense memories and increase the oxygen and sugar going to his brain, allowing for it to work at an increased capacity. But there is a downside to all of that that I think is readily shown. Once humans are enhanced, it's really like burning the candle at both ends, twice the light, half the life. The body quickly begins to be used up, which also shows a difference potentially between a normal person infected versus Justin. We know Justin in the beginning is immunocompromised, and because of this, he has less of a response to the parasitic infection, whereas a normal person's eosinophils would begin attacking the parasite as quickly as possible, and as soon as it was detected. Because of Justin's lesser response, the actual hormone manipulation by the parasite was quite successful for himself, and allowed him to maintain his humanity longer. But you could tell the dude was hungry by him wanting to snack on people. With others after their infection, not only would their immune systems require energy to combat the parasites, but running at higher levels using up sugars brought on by the parasite infection, and the parasite using the same energy pool would dry it up quickly, leading to the host to expire much faster as the parasite continues to eat the person. Basically, it appears that Justin's negligible response to the parasite concerning the immune system is what allowed him to survive longer and enjoy the benefits of the hormonal changes brought on by the parasite, but would still go on to run out of time as the parasite continued along the same route as they do with all humans and replicate within the body of the person leading to their downfall. Now, the final thing I wanted to touch on before I wrap up this disaster of the plot is salt. We see several times throughout the movie that salt gets rid of the parasite themselves, which is great, and much like a slug getting salt on it, forces water out of the parasite, which in turn causes it to become desiccated, and in some cases can actually lice the creature entirely. And this is wonderful because then it can no longer spread, which may be exactly why when it came to the oysters, the parasite directed the oysters to build pearls, because if you didn't know, oysters are exclusively going to live in salt and brackish water. And if the parasites are just absolutely destroyed by salt in general, they would need protection. But that brings up this point. That makes zero sense. Much like a lot of things in this movie, honestly. I always try to explain these, but the plot holes are too large for this one. How is it possible that an oyster was infected with a parasite and the parasite survived to be contained within a pearl if when the parasites are in humans and we touch salt water, our skin falls off? The skin is actually an extremely good water barrier, and you'd think the parasites underneath would be protected from the high salt content. But apparently our skin just kind of sloths itself away if salt even comes into contact with it. Yet, when the parasites were in the flesh of the oyster, it was able to survive. I conclude by saying, whoever suggested I cover this movie, why did you do this?